The earliest version of cuneiform wasn't actually used to write language at all. It was used to count. And that Sumerian system of counting still influences the way that we do math and tell time up until today. Hi, I'm Danny Heber, PhD in linguistics, and this channel, Linguistic Discovery, is all about the science and diversity of language. And today, we're going to talk about how the Sumerian system of counting gave rise to the world's first writing system. The world's first civilization is generally considered to be Sumer, which arose around 5500 BCE. As Sumerian society grew more complex and they established rich trade networks throughout all of Mesopotamia, record keeping became really important, and the need to quantify and tally different types of commodities in trade networks and for administrative purposes. And this was really the first time in world history that this need arose. Most Neolithic or tribal societies don't have a lot of need for extensive systems of counting or counting to really high numbers or extensive systems of record keeping. For example, the Os language of central Siberia doesn't have a word for 1,000, which one speaker explains by saying, in the olden days, our people never needed to count a thousand things, so there's no word for it. The Yanoama language of the Amazon is said to not have any numbers for words higher than three. And the Pitaha language spoken in Brazil is famously claimed by linguist Daniel Everett to not have any words for numbers at all. Now don't get me wrong, many indigenous and tribal communities do have extremely extensive systems of counting, going up to very high numbers. But these extensive counting systems didn't arise out of the administrative or trade needs needs of a large, growing urban society. But extensive systems of record keeping were extremely important for civilizations like Sumer, and that's how the first writing system evolved. Starting around 8000 BCE, we see these small, nondescript clay tokens in the archaeological record, a lot of which have tally marks or other types of markings on them. And different shaped tokens were used to tally different types of objects. For example, the tokens in this picture with crosses on them were thought to have tallied a certain quantity of sheep. But merchants needed to be able to ensure that the right number of goods that they were sending were actually delivered to their destination. So what they started doing was enclosing these tokens within small clay spheres called boli. The recipient could then open these spheres, see the number of tokens that were contained in it, and know that they got the right number of goods. Later, merchants started taking the tokens themselves and pressing them into the outside of the bulla. So you didn't have to break it open to know how many tokens tokens were inside. This kind of defeated the purpose of the bulla in the first place, if you could just look and see what's inside of it. So merchants eventually just started sending the pictographs of the things themselves in clay rather than sending tokens. And that's how the first Sumerian pictographs evolved from these tally tokens. There are at least 30 Sumerian signs that correspond very closely two tokens that have been found in the archaeological record. So the pictograph for sheep looks a lot like the crossed tokens used to tally sheep. Now there were about 800 of these early cuneiform pictograms in total, so 30 isn't a huge number, but the correspondences between the tokens and their pictograph form is really suggestive that there was a historical connection here. Once writing was developing, the bulli themselves became simpler and they started just being used as official seals. And in fact, that later use as seals is where we get the word bull in phrases like a papal bull, the writ that the Pope would issue. Meanwhile, the pictographs were becoming more and more important. Around 3300 BCE, you start seeing the first proto-cuneiform tablets in the city of Uruk. Now I say proto-cuneiform and not just cuneiform, form, because at this point it still wasn't writing. The difference between writing and proto-writing is that writing is used to represent language, whereas proto-writing is a static representation of just information that isn't necessarily systematically related to language. So tally marks, property marks, ink and kipu, certain types of cave paintings, and pictorial signs all tend to fall under the category of proto-writing rather than just writing. And these proto-cuneiform texts were a type of proto-writing. All of the proto-cuneiform tablets are tallies and calculations of different types of objects. Of the about 800 signs that were being used at the time, about 60 were numerals and the rest were pictographic. And these pictographs didn't convey any sort of grammatical information like tense or noun case. They didn't represent sounds. They didn't represent prefixes or suffixes. They were just pictures indicating the object. In fact, because of this, scholars can't actually be sure which language these proto-cuneiform tablets 
was representing. We assume it's Sumerian because that's what it was being used to write much later, but we really don't know. If you see a drawing of an ox, you could pronounce that as the word for ox in any number of languages. It doesn't tell you anything about which language was being spoken. The signs in these proto-cuneiform tablets are arranged in boxes where there's one statement per box. And the order of the signs within each of these statements tends to follow a specific pattern. First, you'll have the numeral, then you'll have the type of thing being counted, and then finally you have other relevant information about the thing being counted. So a statement that says three sheep temple, for example, might mean that three sheep were given to the temple. And this order didn't actually match the order of words in spoken Sumerian, another piece of evidence that this was still proto-writing rather than writing. But even though this proto-cuneiform was only used to count, it was still incredibly complex. The Sumerians used entirely different counting systems for different types of things. Which system you used changed depending on context and the thing you were counting. For example, here's one really important sequence of numerals that was used to count many different types of discrete objects. But they had totally different series of numerals to count things like barley, cereal products, malt, barley groats, different types of land areas, and calendar time. There were 13 different counting systems in total, and you had to figure out which counting system was being used based on the context. Some of the numerals were used in more than one counting system, so you had to figure out what a numeral represented based on which counting system was being used. So the small dot could refer to 10 baskets in the context of sheep, six baskets in the context of barley, or 18 in the context of fields or land area. Another complicated feature of these counting systems is that they counted by either 60s or 120s. They were sexagesimal or bisexagesimal counting systems. Here's one example of a tablet that uses both systems for counting different types of things. And this base 60 counting system is pretty unusual. I only know of one other language called Akari, which is spoken in New Guinea, that has a base 60 counting system. I haven't encountered this anywhere else. So what all this means is that the Sumerians weren't yet using numbers fully abstractly. There's this great quote from the book, The Story of Writing, which says, the cardinal principle of our numeral system, that a numeral is an abstract entity that can be attached to anything from minutes to kilograms of cheese, had not been conceived by the earliest people to count. Now, from today's standpoint, this seems like a deficiency, like a problem with their counting system, but it actually made a lot of sense at the time. Since the primary function of these counting systems was to tally objects, it was actually really useful to be able to see from the number alone what it was you were counting. In fact, this isn't too different from how we talk about uncountable nouns in English. For most mass nouns or things that come in large quantities, we have to use what are called measure words along with the noun. So instead of saying, a wheat, you say a bushel of wheat. And in certain contexts, instead of saying an ale, you would say a pint of ale, or a glass of milk instead of a milk. The words glass, bushel, and pint are what are called measure words. And so English only requires those for uncountable nouns, but some languages, like Mandarin, require them every time you have to count something. The measure word you use depends on the type of thing you're counting. So the Sumerian system of using different types of counters for different types of commodities really isn't actually that exotic. Over time, however, the Sumerian numeral system did simplify, both in its written form and its overall complexity. Scribes started to write using a wedge-shaped stylus, which is what gave the characters their distinctive wedge shape. And in fact, the word cuneiform comes from the Latin word cuneus, meaning wedge. This helped the signs move from becoming less pictographic and more abstract over time. Here's a great example of how the pictograph for head evolved into a more and more abstract symbol over time, until eventually you can't even tell that this is supposed to represent the word head. It's totally arbitrary. And that's one of the key features of fully developed writing systems, is that these signs become arbitrary links to words, rather than pictographic representations of objects. The other way the system simplified is that it reduced all those 13 different types of counting system to one. It was the one used for discrete objects that I showed you earlier. Now right around the same time, the Sumerian civilization was being displaced by the Akkadian Empire. The Akkadian language is actually the earliest documented Semitic language, which was completely unrelated to Sumerian. Sumerian is a language isolate. We don't know what a 
other languages it's related to. So when the Akkadians adopted the Sumerian writing system, they had to adopt it to their language as well and make a number of changes. But even though the Akkadians didn't speak a language with a base 60 counting system, they kept that system of counting by 60s. Later, the Akkadian language divided into two different dialects, Assyrian and Babylonian. And this is what the Babylonian counting system looked like. You can see it actually only really uses two different symbols, the symbol for one and the symbol for 10. They didn't need all the other symbols that the early Sumerians used. And the reason for this is because the Babylonians developed the first positional numeral system. So this is where the value of a number depends on where that number is placed within the larger number. For example, each four in the number 444 has a different value. The first four represents 400, the second four represents 40, and the third four represents four. The Babylonian system is just like this, except that each place value increased the number by a multiple of 60 rather than a multiple of 10. So the single wedge shape could represent either one, 60 or 3600, depending on where it was in the number. So the way you would interpret this number, starting at the right, is you would see three ones in the ones position, and then you would see 23 60s in the 60s position, and then you'd have two 3600s in the 3600s position. When you do the math and add all of those up, you get 8,583. There was one twist, however, which is that the Babylonians hadn't developed a sign for zero, and this made a lot of their numbers really ambiguous. So this number could be interpreted in three different ways. You can interpret it as having two different places, a 60s place and a ones place. So you'd have one set of 60 and 15 ones for a total of 75. You could also interpret it as having three places so that the first number tells you there's one 3600, and then there's nothing in the second place, and then the third place has 15 for a total of 3,615. You could also interpret these place values as fractions. So the first single wedge could just be the number one, followed by the fraction 15 sixtieths, which gives you a total of 1.25. Despite this ambiguity caused by the lack of zero, this was still the first ever positional numeral system. And later scribes even improved this a little bit by simply adding a space where zeros were often intended. Using this base 60 counting system and the ability to represent large numbers and fractions was a huge advancement in mathematics. And the Babylonians developed all sorts of techniques in fractions and algebra and cubic and quadratic equations and even the Pythagorean theorem. This tablet is dated to somewhere between 1800 to 1600 BCE, and it calculates the square root of two to six decimal places. It's because of the Babylonians and their way of doing math that we still have 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. For thousands of years, math and astronomy continued to be done in a base 60 counting system. The Greek astronomer Eratosthenes created a geographical system of mapping the world that divided it up into 60 segments. Later, the Greek astronomer Hipparchus divided the world into 360 segments, so 60 times 6, and each of those segments, each of those degrees, he broke down into 60, and each of those segments he broke down into 60 as well. That first subdivision into 60s he called the partes minutae primae, or the first small parts in Latin, and the second subdivision he called the partes minutae secundae, or the second small parts. Eventually that first subdivision simply became known as the minutes, and the second subdivision simply became known as the seconds. And there may be some other subtle lasting influences of the Babylonian mathematical system as well. In many Indo-European languages, the way you count changes after 60. In Old English, for example, the word for 60 was seichti, whereas the word for 70 was hundseofentig, literally 1070. The hund in that word meant 10, and it was related to the word for 100. And of course, French famously switches to something closer to a base 20 counting system once you hit 60. So the word for 60 is 60, like the word 60, but the word 70 is 70, literally 7010. It's possible, but not at all proven, 
that the lasting cultural influence of Babylonian base 60 counting is why so many Indo-European languages have this interesting break out of number 60. And that is the story of Sumerian numerals, how a simple tally system eventually gave us our first writing system and still influences the way we do math today. If you enjoyed this video and want to support the channel, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Your $5 a month subscription gets you access to bonus videos like this one, as well as a subscriber-only newsletter.